Subcommittee on Energy and Minerals Resources will come to order. Without objection, the chair is authorized to declare recess of the subcommittee at any time. Under committee rule 4F, any oral opening statements at hearings are limited to the chairman and the ranking minority member. I ask unanimous consent that the gentleman from California, Mr. McClintock, the gentleman from Alabama, Mr. Carl, the gentleman from Oregon, Mr. Bentz, the gentlewoman from Virginia, Ms. Kiggins, the gentleman from Guam, Mr. Moylan, and the gentlewoman from Wyoming, Ms. Hageman, be allowed to participate in today's hearing. I now recognize myself for an opening statement. Thank you all for being here today to discuss the programs and budget of both the Bureau of Land Management and the Office of Surface Mining Reclamation and Enforcement. America is blessed with vast natural resources. It is the policy of this subcommittee that we develop here at home under the world's best labor and environmental standards. And the two agencies before us today administer the programs that can make or break <clears throat> our energy production <clears throat> excuse me, while embodying Joe Biden's anti-development quote, which was anywhere but here, end quote, agenda that is making us more dependent on our adversaries. On day one, the Biden administration put a freeze on new oil and gas leasing and reaffirmed the moratorium on coal leasing. And what is the result? Gas prices shot up to over $5 a gallon last summer and currently sit at over $3.50 per gallon. That's over a dollar more per gallon than when President Biden took office and we're just approaching the summer driving season. Energy prices have also gone up under this administration by a staggering 37.2%. Households receiving government help to pay for energy costs increased by another shocking 28%, which is the largest year over year increase since 2009. And why? The BLM under this administration has chosen to ignore law and implement their anti-American energy philosophy through executive fiat. Under the Min Mineral Leasing Act, quarterly lease sales are required and drilling permits or APDs must be processed in 30 days. And while the so-called Inflation Reduction Act required BLM to issue oil and gas lease sales as a prerequisite for approving permits for wind power, and solar power, we see the agency conveniently sidestepping yet another congressional mandate. In fact, this administration has leased fewer acres for oil and gas drilling offshore and on federal land than any other administration since World War II. In fiscal year 2022, the BLM averaged an annual, correction, the BLM approved an average of 233 drilling permits per month. In contrast, the BLM was approving nearly 400 drilling permits monthly in fiscal year 2020 under President Donald Trump. Meanwhile, federal coal development is locked in a moratorium. This is a political choice, and yet headline after headline states that the elect electricity grid is stretched thin. And even the metallurgical coal necessary for steel making, that's exempt from the moratorium, struggles to receive necessary authorizations from this anti-fossil fuel BLM. For example, in my good friend Jerry Carl's district, a coal lease has been in limbo since 2014 for metallurgical coal. America needs an all of the, uh, all of the best approach. Coal generation can exist with wind, solar, oil, gas, hydro, nuclear, and more. And coal production comes with environmental benefits as well. Everybody on this panel knows that fees on current coal production funds abandon coal mine cleanup. However, even mine reclamation funds are now raising questions. SMACRA was given $11.3 billion in the IIJA to accelerate the cleanup of abandoned coal mines, but states are now being told to jump through hoops, deviating from the effective process in place since 1977. Last, and on top of everything else, the newly proposed so-called BLM conservation rule would upend the multiple use mandate on BLM lands and allow this administration to unilaterally lock up more lands absent congressional action. There is truly no end to the Biden administration's overreach. Meanwhile, Republicans offer solutions, the bipartisan Lower Energy Cost Act, which has now passed the House twice, would allow us to develop our resources and permit in reasonable timeframes. I look forward to today's hearing. I now yield to the ranking member, Kamala Dove, for her opening statement. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And thank you to Director Stone Manning and Deputy Director Owens for being here with us today. 
Our public lands are a critical resource. They are unparalleled in their contributions to preserving our country's natural heritage and biodiversity. They harbor diverse ecosystems and critical habitats. They offer opportunities for all Americans to embrace the outdoors and can be ideal locations to deploy renewable energy. But historically, our public lands and waters are also the source of nearly 25% of our country's carbon emissions. I see that as a challenge as we face the consequences of climate change and an opportunity to make our public lands part of the solution. For too long, there's been an imbalance of power on federal lands that swings far toward extractive industries and away from communities and climate action. Fortunately, over the past several years, Congress and the Biden administration have made great strides in achieving policy victories and investments in clean energy, conservation, climate resilience, emissions reductions, and environmental justice communities that will help us reverse course. Through authorities and mandates in the Inflation Reduction Act, the Bureau of Land Management, or BLM, is raising the long outdated royalty rates paid by oil and gas companies operating on federal land to provide a fairer return to the American people, among other important reforms. The agency is taking steps to reduce methane emissions from oil and gas operations, which will improve air quality and public health for the neighboring communities. They are well on their way to reaching the goal of deploying 25 gigawatts of renewable energy capacity by 2025, which will power around 5 million homes. BLM's budget request includes funding for extensive stakeholder engagement, coordination, and environmental review for renewable energy while accelerating responsible clean energy permitting. And most recently, BLM announced a new public lands rule, which will put conservation on equal footing for the first time with other public land uses like grazing, oil and gas, or mineral development. The rule will allow BLM to approve land management in the face of climate change and build more robust and resilient ecosystems. The Office of Surface Mining Reclamation and Enforcement is deploying the $11.3 billion appropriated in the Infrastructure Investments and Jobs Act to clean up abandoned coal mines in communities that the declining industry has left behind. These investments will revitalize economies, creating good union jobs and attracting new economic opportunities while cleaning up legacy pollution sites. But my colleagues on the other side of the aisle are proposing deep cuts that would devastate these agencies and put it at risk. If Republicans had their way, they'd cut off the job-creating power reclamation, they'd halt all progress on renewable energy development, and they'd let oil and gas developments go unregulated without inspections. And it's all to play into Speaker McCarthy's ransom note of demands over the debt limit. But it's not just budget cuts that they're threatening. They're also pushing to tie H.R. 1, the Polluters Over People Act, to the debt limit, a bill that would devastate our public lands, communities, and the climate. It's entirely inappropriate. It's hostage taking, but we know at this point that they'd go to any lengths for the polluting industries lining their pockets. You'll hear Republicans accuse Democrats of pushing an anti-industry agenda, but let's get the facts straight. We have until 2030 to reduce our emissions by 50% or have any chance of staving off the worst impacts of climate change. We're pushing a people-first agenda and tackling the climate head-on. My Republican colleagues will ask why the Biden administration isn't selling off more of our public lands to the oil and gas industry. But I will remind everyone that the United States is already the number one producer of oil and gas in the world, and that the fossil fuel leases on public land currently cover 24 million acres, nearly half of which is sitting locked up but unused. They'll claim that the Biden administration is killing coal, but their heads are in the sand. We can fund them fully and appropriately so that they can conduct proper tribal consultation and efficient and environmental reviews for transmission and renewable energy and make sure the fossil fuel industry is cleaning up after itself. I look forward to hearing more about how BLM and OSMRE support these shared goals. I yield back. Thank you very much. I will now introduce our witnesses. 
the Honorable Tracy Stone Manning, Director of the Bureau of Land Management here in Washington, D.C. And Ms. Glenda Owens, the Deputy Director, Office of Surface Mining Reclamation and Enforcement out of Washington, D.C. I will now recognize Director Stone Manning for five minutes. Welcome. Thank, <clears throat> thank you, Chairman Stauber and Ranking Member Kamlerger Dove uh, and members of the subcommittee. I am Tracy Stone Manning, the Director of the Bureau of Land Management, and it is an honor to be sitting in this storied hearing with, room with you today. Thank you for the opportunity to testify on the fiscal year 2024 budget, priorities, and the mission of the BLM. We are the nation's largest land manager, responsible for one in 10 acres in this country. The multiple use, sustained yield mission established by the Federal Land Policy and Management Act directs us to sustain the health, diversity, and productivity of 245 million acres of public lands and 700 million acres of mineral estate for multiple uses. These lands provide food, fiber, minerals, energy, water, habitat, and lifetime memories for countless families. They're open to all. In fiscal year 2021, public lands managed by the BLM supported $201 billion in economic output and 783,000 jobs. Equally and vitally important is the work we do to conserve, protect, and restore public lands and nationally significant landscapes for the benefit of current and future generations. The President's fiscal year 24 budget request of $1.7 billion for the BLM balances our responsibilities and advances the administration's priorities to address the climate crisis, accelerate responsible renewable energy development on public lands, create family supporting union jobs, and strengthen diversity equity, and inclusion in our work. The proposed budget emphasizes investments to improve the health and resilience of public lands from the stresses brought on by climate change, such as historic widespread drought and wildland fires of increasing scope and intensity. That's why the budget requests $304.3 million for the BLM's land resources activity, which provides for the management of forests, rangelands, and cultural resources, as well as wild horses and burrows. As we transition to a clean energy economy, the remarkable solar, wind, and geothermal potential on our public lands can and must help meet Congress and the administration's goal of permitting 25 gigawatts of renewable energy on public lands by 2025. The budget reflects this priority by proposing 72.5 million in our renewable energy management program, an increase of 77%. <clears throat> I'm so pleased that much needed investments from the bipartisan infrastructure law and the Inflation Reduction Act will enable us to put people to work on our public lands, restoring wildlife habitat and clean water, enabling us to leave these lands better off than we found them. Conservation is a key part of BLM's mission. With over 900 units of national conservation lands covering about 35 million acres, which includes national monuments and wilderness. These areas are also the current and ancestral homelands of tribal nations and indigenous peoples, many of whom have deep cultural and spiritual connection to these places. In addition, our neighbors across the country count on public lands managed by the BLM as beloved recreation destinations. The ever-increasing interest in these lands requires additional support, and the budget request for the National Conservation Lands Program is $11.3 million above the fiscal year 23 enacted level. Throughout all of our work, we prioritize supporting the administration's efforts to create good-paying jobs and advance environmental justice, a priority that is emphasized in the budget request and in our programs to remediate and reclaim orphaned wells and abandoned mines. The budget also includes an increase of $12 million to help establish the su and support the Job Youth Corps program, which will enable the BLM to employ young adults and veterans. Above all, the proposed budget reflects the administration's continued commitment to striking the right balance of land conservation and sustainable use of resources. It's incumbent on us as professional land managers to ensure that this activity is sustainable and beneficial to all Americans, regardless of where they live, and to future generations. We take this responsibility seriously. 
I look forward to working with the subcommittee to provide us with the tools and resources necessary to achieve these important objectives. Thank you for the opportunity to testify today. Good morning, uh, Chairman Stauber and Ranking Member Dove, and members of the subcommittee. Thank you for the invitation to testify on behalf of the Office of Surface Mining Reclamation and Enforcement on the President's FY 2024 budget request and priorities for OSMRE. In accordance with the Surface Mining Control and Reclamation Act of 1977, OSMRE continues to work diligently in ensuring that the nation's coal mines operate in a manner that protects citizens and the environment during mining and after mining, and in addressing the legacy hazards and environmental degradation that occurred before the law was passed. OSMRE's FY 2024 budget request is $301.9 million, which is $11.9 million above the FY 23 enacted level. The FY 2024 budget request for the regulation and technology appropriation is $127.3 million, and for the abandoned mine reclamation fund appropriation is $174.6 million. $200 million of OSMRE's FY 2024 budget request for discretionary appropriations provides financial assistance in the form of regulatory grants of $65 million and AMLER grants of $135 million to eligible states and tribes. $101.9 million covers OSMRE's operational costs in fulfilling its MACRA responsibilities. The FY 2024 budget request also includes $1.3 billion in mandatory funding for reclamation grants to states and tribes and for the United Mine Workers of America Health Benefit Plans and the 1974 UMWA Pension Plans. This budget request for discretionary appropriations enables OSM to execute its five business line activities. The budget request of $90.6 million for the Environmental Protection Business Line will enable OSMRE to provide regulatory grants to fund 23 primacy state regulatory programs and the regulatory program development costs for three tribes. This request also enables OSMRE to fund federal regulatory programs in non-primacy states, carrying out mining plan reviews for federal lands and continue efforts to streamline mining plan decision processes, among other things. The budget request of $155.4 million for environmental restoration focuses on state and tribal AML program evaluations, abatement of high priority coal mining related hazards through the federal reclamation program and strategic partnerships to address acid mine drainage and other water pollution problems. Environmental restoration also funds OSMRE's administration of the AMLA program, providing eligible states and tribes with grants to accelerate the reclamation of AML sites in connection with economic and community development in uses. Environmental restoration funds the Passive Treatment Protection Program, providing grants to non-governmental organizations and local and state governmental agencies to operate, maintain, and rehabilitate AML passive treatment systems. The budget request of $21.3 million for the Technology Development and Transfer Line enables OSMRE to provide technical support and training to states and tribes to ensure they have the necessary technical skills and expertise needed to effectively operate their SMACRA programs. The budget request of $7 million for financial management enables OSMRE to carry out its financial management responsibilities through fee compliance, revenue management, and grants accounting management. Under this business line, OSMRE also manages the statutorily required transfers to the UMWA and determines AML fund investments. The budget request of $27.6 million for the executive direction and administration activities 
funds activities that are integral to the development, leadership, and guidance provided across all areas of OSMRE's macro responsibilities. In sum, the FY 2024 budget request will enable OSMRE to effectively work with the states and tribal partners to address the wide range of environmental and public health and safety problems associated with coal mining activities. Thank you for the opportunity to testify this morning, and I'm happy to answer any questions that you may have. Thank you very much. Before we get to the questions, I do want to ask unanimous consent to also wave on to the committee representative, Katie Porter from California. Without objection, so moved. Um, we are getting to the questions now, and I will uh, recognize myself for five minutes. Ms. Stone Manning, I'm from northern Minnesota. In northern Minnesota, we hunt and fish and recreate. We also mine and harvest our timber. We talk about the three pillars of timber, taconite, and tourism uh, in Minnesota. During your 2021 confirmation process, it came to light that you typed a letter using a pen name to the U.S. Forest Service stating in part, and I quote, you bastards go in there anyway and a lot of people get hurt. End quote. If unnoticed, tree spikes can cause serious injuries for workers. In fact, a mill worker lost half his job because of a tree spike placed by an eco-terrorist. This is a simple yes or no question. Do you condemn tree spiking and other forms of eco-terrorism? Congressman, yes. Yes or no, do you commit to a zero tolerance policy when dealing with acts of eco-terrorism? Congressman, yes. Thank you. Director Stone Manning, what was the average number of applications for permits to drill issued by the Bureau of Land Management per uh, month in fiscal year 2022? Congressman, I don't have the monthly average, but I know that uh, in fiscal year 22, the BLM received 3,729 APD requests, and we re approved 3,010 of them. Uh, operators drilled on just over 2,000 of them. The, um, the applications for fiscal year 2022 uh, for the applications to permits to drill were 238. Do you know how many the Trump administration issued on average per month in fiscal year 2020? I do not. 386, meaning your department's APD approvals have declined by 40%. Ms. Stone Manning, this is embarrassing, but par for the course, as President Biden stated on his campaign, and I quote, I guarantee you we're going to end fossil fuel, end quote. Is this 40% reduction intentional as part of President Biden's stated campaign goal of ending fossil fuel? Chairman Stauber, it's my understanding that um, in the first two years of the Biden administration, we approved more APDs than in the first two years of the Trump administration. Uh, and there are 6,755 APDs that are out there and the industry is choosing not to use. The president has urged them to use them. Do you, um, as far as the APDs go, is it your intention to continue to increase those applications uh, in, uh, within the next two years of this administration? Congressman, we, res we respond to the uh, applications we receive in a timely manner and we get them back out the door. The IIJA created a categorical exclusion for gathering lines for oil and gas operations to reduce quantity of methane. Mm -hmm. To your knowledge, has the department used this categorical, categorical exclusion? Yeah, it's a helpful tool, but uh, as I understand it, we've uh, been asked once to do it and have done it in Colorado. You've used it once? In Colorado. How many requests? Uh, I don't know the answer to that question, Congressman. I can get back to you on that. But I believe just once. Do you have an idea of how, how many requests? Would you have any idea? No, I, I believe it's just once, but I can confirm that and get back to you. Okay, and I appreciate that. Uh, can, can you please commit to following the law and using the categorical exclusion to increase methane capture? Uh, absolutely, Congressman, that's what we do, follow the law. The, um, a couple more questions. Have there been any new coal leases 
or lease modifications approved either for thermal or metallurgical coal, which is not under the leasing ban, as you know, under the Department of the Interior, under the Biden administration? Uh, it's my understanding that we approved a, a lease expansion in North Dakota at the center mine. How many have been requested? Uh, I don't have that number off the top of my head, Congressman. Will you commit to getting yeah. that information to the committee? Yeah, we will, we will. I will check with my folks at the department and get back to you. Okay, with that being said, I would hope that uh, the, the philosophy of um, keep it in the ground mentality change under your leadership. I think that uh, you know that many areas of our nation have natural resources and are abundant. And so we can do these activities and keep our, our environment clean. And so with that, my time's up. I am going to turn it over to Ranking Member Com Logger Dub. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, Director Stone Manning, you mentioned that communities of color, low-income families, rural and indigenous communities have long suffered disproportionate and cumulative effects from air and water pollution. Glad to see that you're trying to address some of those disproportionate impacts in your budget. Um, can you, well, A, do you believe that these communities are important? Absolutely, Congresswoman. Okay. Good to have that on the record for everyone. Can you elaborate on how the proposed budget increase will support underserved communities that have been adversely impacted by energy and mining activities in the past? Congresswoman, thanks for the question. I think we're doing that in two ways. First, we're uh, making the transition to a clean energy economy so that we can blunt future pollution um, from occurring to future communities. Uh, second, uh, through investments of the Bipartisan Infrastructure Law and the Inflation Reduction Act, we're putting people to work, restoring these places, restoring uh, abandoned orphan and orphaned oil and gas wells, for example, um, restoring uh, landscapes that have been impacted by climate change, uh, and, and we're, um, the budget reflects that we're trying to do that as much as possible by bringing in youth through the youth corps. Great, thank you. And um, what is BLM doing to improve community protections from oil and gas development, especially those who have been disproportionately um, impacted, who share the burden? And how would the Republican proposed budget cuts hurt those protections, I ask, because in my district, we have the largest urban oil field in the United States. Uh, Congresswoman, thanks for the question. Um, uh, we're approaching the oil and gas uh, program to try and make it as balanced and responsible as possible. Uh, so we are uh, asking companies to uh, focus their development in places that have, have high potential for oil and gas. Um, we have put in a number of provisions and the bipartisan infrastructure law put in another uh, abundant provisions, excuse me, to um, make a fair return for the taxpayer. Uh, and um, forthcoming in, the, in a couple months uh, will be uh, an oil and gas rulemaking, I think, as you all have seen on the unified agenda, um, that will help us ensure those uh, um, policies into the future. Great. And last question. Do you ever not follow the law? Congresswoman, I always follow the law. Thanks for okay. the question. <laughs> Thank you for that. Uh, Deputy Director Owens, your agency handles the regulation of current coal mining and the cleanup of coal mines abandoned before the industry was regulated in 1977. As you mentioned in your testimony, OSM is now administering a cleanup program with more than $11 billion over the next 15 years. How is OSMRE leveraging those funds to boost economic development and create jobs and communities that have been left behind by the declining coal industry? Thank you, Thank you for that question, Representative Dove. OSM has been working diligently since the passage of the B B I infra Bill in Bipartisan Infrastructure Law, we call it Bill, uh, back at OSMRE. But since the passage of the bill, we have been working with our states and tribal partners soliciting feedback um, on how we can most effectively, as you say, leverage these dollars. This historic investment of over $11 billion is a once in a generation uh, opportunity for us to actually get out there and get the funds. At, before the bill 
was enacted, the uh, reclamation fee collection was uh, scheduled to expire. With the extension of the bill and the 15-year uh, funding that we have, we are getting more money out to states than ever before. Um, the highest um, state, the highest amount of funding received by one state, Pennsylvania, and one this year, FY 2022, was $244 million. That's more than the monies that went out for the entire AML program in uh, FY 2022, uh, 23, uh, 21, sorry. Um, but the exponential increase of funding for the AML program and the opportunities that are created, the broadening of the scope, um, the opportunity to create jobs, uh, to hire displaced uh, coal workers, um, and to um, require and ensure cleanup in areas that had not been, we had not been able to reach under the historic traditional AML fee-based program, the opportunities now for us, as I say, are exponential. And we have the 15 years now to, to take advantage of this funding and to get into those communities that have been adversely impacted by those um, legacy mine sites that had been abandoned uh, prior to SMACRA's uh, enactment in 1977. Thank you for that. Uh, my time is up and I yield back, Mr. Chair. Thank you. We'll now recognize the chairman of the full committee, uh, Mr. Westerman. Thank you, Chairman Stalbert. Thank you, Director Stone Manning and Director Owens for being here today. Uh, Director Stone Manning, the, uh, I was reading in the newspaper this morning about BLM's proposal to sell land or, or to do conservation uh, leases, I guess is what you would call it. Uh, on BLM land, and I'm a little bit confused, but could you tell me what BLM, de how BLM defines conservation or how you personally define conservation? Uh, Congressman Westerman, thanks for the question. Um, the public lands rule envisions, uh, the, I think the conservation lease portion of that rule that you're referring to is for two purposes, uh, for restoration activities and for uh, compensatory mitigation. So if you go back to Teddy Roosevelt, he said that uh, conservation means development <clears throat> as much as protection. We hear, often hear it called wise use. Um, you know, conservation, in my, my idea of conservation, is you use it and leave it better for future generations. So my question is, is BLM not practicing conservation on lands that are leased for other purposes right now? Uh, Congressman, yes, we are. And the part, uh, the interesting thing about the public lands rules is it um, expresses the part of our uh, Organic Act, FLIPMA, um, that require us to uh, protect fish and wildlife habitat, protect scenic values, protect cultural values. Can you not, is, does this mean that multiple use is antiquated, that we can't have multiple use anymore? Because my understanding was that <clears throat> we were going to have multiple use on these public lands with conservation everywhere that we, we use the lands. Are you saying multiple use and conservation are mutually exclusive? I'm not. I'm, uh, that what the rule does is make conservation an equal among multiple uses. But so there, is, is, it, is conservation a multiple use or is it an ethic that should be practiced across all uses? We are, uh, we are raising it. Um, uh, we're not raising it. We're expressing what FLIPMA asks us to do, which is to make those values an equal. Um, and if, there are three buckets, basically, to the rule. One that looks at protection of uh, intact landscapes, as FLIPMA asks us to do. One that looks at restoration, as the landscape is requiring us to do. And one to make wise decisions um, based on science and data. And I think that third point gets to what you're talking about. Of course, that's conservation, bringing uh, science data um, into our deeper it's, into it's our It's giving the impression that there's no conservation taking place on BLM lands now, so you've got to set aside a new category and call it conservation, which I think is, is very concerning to me if BLM is not practicing conservation where you have um, oil and, and mineral leases, uh, where you have grazing. Uh, conservation should be throughout all of the uses on BLM land. And also, 
some of the actions of BLM are telling me that conservation is not being practiced. If you look at wildfire, we've seen uh, an average of about 2 million acres per year uh, go on BLM land uh, go up in flames. And if you, you do a rough calculation, you're probably looking at 30 or 40 million tons of carbon being released every year off of BLM lands. That doesn't seem like conservation to me. So shouldn't BLM be focused more on practicing conservation uh, under the programs that you've already got rather than trying to set aside more land to put them in programs like BLM manages forest land, which is really not managed at all. It's being mismanaged. Um, and you talked about science. Uh, there's been this push. Um, your agency actually released a report on old growth with the Forest Service that clearly recognized that mature forests are not scientifically recognized term in forestry. Uh, if you really claim to utilize the best science, uh, why is BLM proposing to fundamentally change the way we manage these forests on flawed science? Uh, Congressman, thanks for the question. The technical report that I think you're uh, referring to was written by scientists. Uh, um, yeah, and they and said that your terminology is is wrong. I've got to go quickly to Ms. Owens. Uh, when Secretary Holland was here, she talked about 20 new mines, uh, mine modifications or expansions that your agency has approved since 2021. Can you tell me what new mines or modifications or expansions those were? Uh, Representative Westerman, thank you for the question. Um, um, most recently, in fact, on May 12th, OSMR, the department approved a mining plan modification for the center mine uh, in North Dakota. And uh, we have... Uh, what kind of mine was that? In, uh, in center mine, what kind of mine? What were they mining there? Um, I, 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 don't, I don't know exactly. Um, it was not met call, um, but um, I can get that information for you. Yeah, we've asked for that information and nobody's been able to provide it so far. Uh, so there's, you're familiar with one mine that's been? Well, that is the one that was most recently approved, mining yeah. plan. Secretary Holland uh, said there were 20. Um, can you I'm get not, that list for us? We don't have 20, uh, I'm sorry. I think uh, they Secretary Holland may have been also including uh, mining plan um, from or lease uh, NEPA uh, decisions uh, for leasing as well as mining. I would think with the uh, the emphasis on electrifying the economy that BLM will be cranking out as many critical mineral and copper mine permits as you could possibly do, but that seems to be just the opposite. I understand uh, the political bias against fossil fuels, which I think is incorrect, but I understand that, but I do not understand the attack on mining and the failure to utilize our resources to achieve the objectives that the administration said it wants to achieve. I yield back. If Thank I'm you, Mr. Chair. The chair now recognizes Mr. Huffman from California. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, uh, and thank you uh, to our witnesses for being here. I want to applaud uh, BLM for promoting renewable energy development on our public lands, despite the challenges of all of those uh, deadbeat APDs that form a che checkerboard on the BLM map uh, around much of the country, uh, limiting our ability uh, to be creative and do some of these other things on our public lands. But you have lowered uh, rental rates, you have updated the solar programmatic environmental impact statement, uh, and uh, you are on track to more than achieve the most recent renewables goal that we've set, putting us in the nice position of raising the bar and setting a new goal. So these things that you've done um, are a type of streamlining, a type of permit reform, uh, kind of goes against one of the prevailing narratives around here right now, but a lot of this is already happening uh, under your leadership, and I appreciate it. So as we're aware, uh, reaching the administration's clean energy goals will not just include investing in renewable energy development, but also transmission. And so um, I want to ask you a little bit about how we are going to provide that power uh, generation and transmission. Uh, I represent the North Coast of California. Humboldt Bay uh, is the site of uh, two of California's five offshore wind lease locations. Uh, and BLM lands could very well come into play when it comes to 
the transmission upgrades, we're gonna need to bring that energy online. Can you tell us how BLM is working to ensure transmission capacity is ready for the future build out of clean energy? Congressman, thanks for the question. We're laser focused on tra transmission. Uh, the electrons that we are producing uh, with solar and wind uh, and all forms of energy need to get from point A to point B. Um, we're working on nine transmission lines uh, as we speak and uh, ha happily um, uh, did a ribbon cutting just a couple months ago on one in the Southwest, uh, ribbon cutting coming in June on one in, in Wyoming. Um, and we're working across the federal government, um, working very closely with the Department of Energy uh, to ensure that we can get this really important work done. Yeah, thank you for that. So the Inflation Reduction Act uh, gave you some new authorities to improve the antiquated uh, oil and gas leasing program that includes raising royalty rates and adding a royalty on all extracted methane, included methane that's lost um, through venting, flaring, or negligent release. Uh, I know you're working on a rulemaking on this issue as well, uh, and I think we've got a long way to go uh, to bring this uh, program into the 21st century. Uh, but let me just ask you how these new authorities and the BLM rulemaking on methane are going to help reduce emissions on public lands. Congressman, thanks for the question. Um, we're trying to uh, focus uh, development uh, in the very best places. Um, at the waste prevention rule I think that you're speaking of is going to help reduce uh, wasted gas, literally burning money and a resource uh, unnecessarily. Um, and then oil and gas rulemaking um, is going to implement what the Congress has done uh, through rule um, and then also uh, address bonding, which we think will help the overall program uh, on behalf of the American taxpayer. All right, thank you. I want to ask about conservation. Uh, I think you can see that that's become a word that makes uh, some of our colleagues across the aisle squirm these days, unless you're defining conservation as some type of polluting extractive industry use. Uh, most of us define it a little bit differently, uh, but certainly it is embedded in BLM's multiple use mission. Can you um, tell us a little more about how uh, your work is not going to negatively impact BLM's multiple use mission or the original intent of uh, FLIPMA? Why is conservation perfectly consistent with that? Uh, Congressman, thanks for the job and the 10,000 people that work for us do conservation uh, every day and want to be able to have more tools in the toolbox to do that work. Um, the Federal Land Policy and Management Act expressly states uh, in Section 208 that our management needs to preserve and protect certain public lands in their natural condition. It needs to provide food and habitat for fish and wildlife and domestic animal, as well as for outdoor recreation and human occupancy. It needs to protect the scientific, scenic, historic, ecological, environmental, air and atmospheric and cultural values to just name a few. <laughs> the framework that is the public lands rule is going to give us a consistent way to deliver on what FLIPMA is asking us to do. Thank you, and just by way of perspective, what percentage of the 245 million acres of land you manage uh, is open for leasing oil and gas? Uh, Congressman, over 90%. Uh-huh, and how about hard rock mining? Uh, Congressman, all of our lands are open to hard rock mining unless uh, uh, expressly withdrawn. Does the new proposed rule undermine any valid existing rights? It does not. Just one last question. Uh, when you manage for conservation, uh, you don't just let land go feral, right? I mean, if you're gonna try to restore native grasslands, you're probably, at least for some period of time, gonna employ grazing as part of that conservation management, right? That's right. Conservation in a time of climate change is active work. All right, well, I thank you very much. Uh, it seems to me that this proposed rule is perfectly consistent with your mission. In fact, it's a refreshing modernization uh, of it uh, and a system that's been wildly out of balance in favor of extractive industry for too long. I yield back. Thank you, Congressman. The chair now recognizes uh, Mr. Lamborn for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and uh, thank you for having this important hearing. And uh, Representative Huffman, I think that you may consider this a modernization of the language in the bill, but it's an expansion that's outside the parameter of the definitions of what's the mission of the agency under the bill. So, uh, Ms. Stone Manning, uh, Director Stone Manning, what is the legal justification 
for proposing this rule because conservation leases are not mentioned in the Organic Act that con created and uh, defined the obligations of Bureau of Land Management today. Uh, thank you, Congressman, for the question. Um, Section 302 of uh, the Federal Land Policy and Management Act um, d tells the Secretary that she has many tools in which uh, to use, um, and leasing authority is one of those tools. Apart from that, let me ask you about the application that you're intending to use this newly created land use for. Um, if there's a parcel of land which has a conservation land use or lease uh, that's been given out in the future, uh, will grazing be able to be done on that same land? Absolutely. Will energy development be able to be done on that same land? Once the conservation lease is, has expired, is that the question? During the term of the conservation uh, lease. Um, the term of the conservation lease uh, uh, would, would preclude uses that uh, directly conflict with the underlying conservation lease, and each one's gonna be different. Would mining of resources be able to be done during the term of a conservation lease? Uh, again, uh, it would likely conflict. Uh, would recreation be able to be done during the term of a conservation lease? Yes, likely. Would timber harvesting be able to be done during the uh, duration of a conservation lease? Uh, depending, uh, for, a lot of forest work uh, is necessary for restoration of watersheds, uh, and so that would uh, likely be a compatible use. Wow, you're creating a new use and you're crowding out the uses that you're supposed to be doing. You've got, you've got things backwards. This is kind of amazing. This is breathtakingly arrogant on the part of the agency. Um, let me change subjects here and ask you about a proposed um, use of $7 million or 17% of the budget for deferred maintenance and capital improvements to install electric vehicle charging infrastructure. Wouldn't it be a better use of the valuable taxpayer dollars and your, your mandate to be doing things like promoting rangeland health, reducing the risk of wildfires, and carrying out what's supposed to be the multiple use uh, mandate that you have? Congressman, thanks for that question. Those other uses uh, do have increases in the budget that I hope you'll take a good look at. Um, the EV infrastructure that you're referring to is part of a uh, administration priority. I remember back when I was uh, the d director of the Department of Environmental Quality in Montana and the previous governor had swapped the whole um, uh, fleet of state cars to, to hybrids and everybody thought he was nuts and it ended up saving us millions of dollars. Have you looked at the lifetime uh, use of energy and the pollution caused by an EV versus an internal combustion engine car, including the mining of lithium and everything else that goes into making the batteries of the EV? Congressman, I have not done that analysis. I imagine somebody has. Yeah, I, I, wonder, I wonder about that. Uh, well, I'll be talking to the appropriators and uh, maybe we can strip that out. Um, Mr. Chairman, that's all I have. I yield back. Thank you, Mr. Lambord. The chair now recognizes Ms. Lee from Nevada for five minutes. Uh, thank you, Chair Stauber. Um, Director Stone Manning, good to see you. Last month, I had the opportunity to ask Secretary Deb Holland about this proposed public lands rule, and she emphasized that uh, this conservation-centered rulemaking does not intend to slow down clean energy uh, development projects. Uh, I believe the secretary, and uh, I don't question the rules intent, but I've continued to hear some concerns from stakeholders, especially in, in my district, uh, that the rule may have a chilling effect on clean energy development, regardless of its intent. And so what would you say in response um, to these worries that the language about maintaining intact landscapes and ecosystem resilience, for instance, could inadvertently block out uh, clean energy from BLM lands and obviously have an impact of, uh, on the goal of transitioning to renewable, 100% renewable 
our, our clean electricity by 2035, you know, making that unachievable. Congresswoman, thank you for the question. I, um, I recall reading one of your quotes when the proposed rule came out and you uh, wondered if the BLM can walk and chew gum at the same time. And we do that every day. Um, it, it's what we do with a multiple use mission. Um, I have no doubt that we are gonna be able to deliver on the incredible resources in your state. We're on track for 13 gigawatts and there's a whole bunch uh, um, coming up right behind it. Um, I, what this rule is gonna enable us to do is be smart, be smart and thoughtful about where and how that development happens. Uh, thank you. You know, um, the office of uh, uh, OIRA yeah, typically reviews all significant rulemakings and I understand that OIRA has claimed that this rule um, one that has been characterized as a seismic shift in land management is somehow not, is not significant and therefore not subject to OIRA review. Uh, I also uh, understand that BLM int intends to apply a categorical exclusion to the proposed rule, then run it through the NEPA process. Um, wouldn't it make sense for OIRA and BLM to subject this public uh, lands rule to a more thorough review now uh, to minimize the potential for mutual headaches and misunderstandings um, with clean energy advocates as well as agricultural, you know, recreational stakeholders. We're hearing several other uh, stakeholder views here today uh, down the road. Uh, Congresswoman, thank you for the question. Uh, the final rule is going to um, have a categorical exclusion right along with it because this rule is procedural in nature um, and uh, therefore doesn't require uh, the full uh, extent of NEPA. Some of the things that it may um, do, like restoration projects, those of course, as they happen, will undergo NEPA. Um, but the rule itself is largely procedural, We're talking about landscape health assessments and gathering science and data um, and doing a lot of procedural steps. That, that's why it's got a, it's got a CADEX. Uh, that's good to hear. I, I want to know is um, how quickly then it sounds like BLM would be able to quickly course correct in, in the event that when this takes effect, uh, you know, that some of these concerns of the clean energy community bear out. I'm, is, that my, is my understanding correct that BLM would be able to quickly course correct then? Uh, yeah, again, we can walk and chew gum at the same time. I, have, I am confident we are going to be able to not only meet our, our uh, gigawatt goals for 2025, but exceed them and into the future do that same level of work. And then finally, um, can, and we have been dealing in Nevada with uh, delays primarily because of staffing. Mm -hmm. Can you uh, comment on what the impact of the proposed budget by the uh, Republican budget would have uh, on your staffing and being able to process all of these uh, applications? Congresswoman, I've heard the um, number 25%, and um, I am certain that we would fail to deliver for the American people if our budget was slashed by 25%. For example, in renewable energy, we're working on 64 projects right now um, that are gonna deliver, uh, if all go through, 30 gigawatts of capacity. Um, and there are 147 projects waiting in the wings. Um, what I need to get those projects off the ground are people, which is why you see the budget increase that you see in this proposed budget of the president's of 77% in the renewable energy management line. Thank you, I yield. Thank you very much. The chair now recognizes uh, Mr. Hunt from Texas for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you so much for being here to the witnesses. I really appreciate your time. Uh, my first question is for you, uh, Ms. Stone Manning. I have a question for you, and it is, is the oil and gas industry important to the future of our country, ma'am? Uh, Congressman, uh, it is. So I think I would actually obviously 100% agree with that. A little background on me, I'm from Houston, Texas, energy capital of the world. The entire energy corridor is in my districts. This is an issue that's very uh, near and dear to my heart. And I can tell you that oil and gas will be a part of our future for a very long time, at least for sure, in my lifetime. And one of my favorite quotes actually came from Bill Gates when he said, just kind of paraphrasing, of course, 
that if we were able to miraculously snap our fingers and if every single American drove an EV tomorrow, we would only decrease the demand of a barrel of oil by 8%. We would still use 92% of a barrel of oil because of all the byproducts of the industry. So I think it's clear that we're not going anywhere for the foreseeable future. And I want to ensure uh, that we continue to make production um, as easy and as attainable for companies to provide us with energy and goods for the future. Uh, is it true that your department has a statutory obligation to approve or deny an application for permit to drill within 30 days of receipt of a complete APD package? Uh, yes, Congressman. Are you aware of the average APD issuance timeline by your field offices to date? Uh, Congressman, it, it, there's a back and forth. Uh, mm -hmm. We ask the company for information. Sometimes it takes them quite a bit of time to get us that information back. Um, I've looked at the timelines. I've dug in and asked uh, why there are. Um, uh, uh, sometimes delays. Um, some of it's on us, 109 days yeah. uh, on BLM, but it's 162 days uh, on average that we wait for information to come back from the com company. So given the 30-day statutory requirement, it, it, do you think that's an acceptable timeline, uh, considering that's significantly more than, than, than the 30 days allotted? And I know there's a lot of challenges here, but I guess, go ahead, ma'am. Yeah, yeah uh, for a complete application, um, we, we, you know, we need to make sure uh, that everybody is, is crossing uh, T's and dotting I's so that we follow the law. Um, and sometimes it uh, takes a while for the companies to get back to us. Mm -hmm. Sometimes we have uh, delays over litigation, and frankly, sometimes um, our delays are because our staff are uh, burning the candle at both ends. I understand that. So. In order to get this, I think, within better compliance, do you have a plan or an idea of what we can do to implement uh, anything, or how can we actually help you to achieve these goals to get it closer to that 30-day to that limit? Uh, I appreciate the question, and I, I, I would ask us also to look at the big picture. There are s over 6,700 APDs uh, that are sitting unused by the industry right now. How many say, can you say again? I'm sorry to hear that. Uh, over 6,700. Okay. Lastly, ma'am, I do I want to say this. These timelines are really putting a burden on, on a lot of companies, especially in my district. They impact us every day. And there's also a symbiotic relationship between my district in Houston, Texas, and the Permian Basin. And I'm hearing from companies every single day that these timelines are absolutely crippling in the industry. And I'm not kidding. I get calls to my staff every day. And I really want to make sure that we work together, R or D, I really don't care, to get this within compliance. And so uh, as a question, just, just, just so we can work together here, uh, it, it, would you commit to uh, decreasing the average time of an APD by 25% by the end of the year? Uh, Congressman, I would ask that you um, uh, support the president's budget, which reflects an increase of $10.4 million in our oil and gas uh, management line. That would help. Okay. Well, thank you so much, ma'am, and I yield back my time. Thank you very much. The chair now recognizes uh, Representative Velasquez from New York for thank five you. minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Director Stone Manning, uh, welcome. The Inflation Reduction Act, which Democrats uh, passed last Congress, included several boosts to clean energy infrastructure through more than $1 billion in the IRA for federal agency permitting offices. Um, how is the Bureau of Land Management using Inflation Reduction Act funds to shrink timelines for permitting specifically for renewable energy projects on federal land? Uh, Congresswoman, thank you for the question and also thank you for the congressional support um, uh, for um, speeding up uh, permitting in the form of extra people. Uh, we're using some of that permitting funding for uh, the solar prog programmatic environmental impact statement, which will help us guide uh, solar development uh, to the right places um, so that when projects come in, we've uh, done a bunch of the an analysis up top. I think that's really going to help. And can you give an overview of how the deep budget cuts proposed by Republicans impact the Bureau's ability to promote renewable energy development on our public lands? Thanks for the question. Um, again, we have over... Uh, 
170, I think, um, proposals that are waiting in the waiting in the wings mm -hmm. um, to be analyzed, uh, which is why you see the request in this budget for a 77% increase in the renewable energy management line. That's people. That's people doing the work and doing the analysis. Um, if we faced deep cuts, um, we it, it takes people to do this work, and uh, uh, so we would not be able to deliver on our commitment for an energy um, secure future to the American people. Thank you. And as you mentioned, the FY24 uh, budget includes 72.5 million for the Renewable Energy Management Program. This funding increase, among others, will help meet the administration's renewable energy and greenhouse gas emission reduction goals. Can you talk briefly about how the proposed budget will allow renewable energy coordinating offices to meet the expected um, demand for renewable, renewable, renewable energy development over the next couple of years? And if there are additional ways Congress can support your work to deploy renewable energy, please uh, share with us. Yeah, thank you for that question, Congresswoman. Um, uh, I, I think I misspoke a second ago. It's 147 projects waiting in the wings mm -hmm. that would deliver over 50 gigawatts of power. Um, the additional funding from Congress would uh, help us do the analysis necessary to get those projects out the door, but also help us uh, um, coordinate with uh, other agencies. There are many equities involved. Um, Often uh, we need to work with our colleagues at the Fish and Wildlife Service to ensure that we're meeting uh, laws guiding uh, sensitive species. So the additional support would help us uh, uh, do what the American people is asking us to do, which is um, have a fully functioning um, uh, approach to governing. In other ways, in other words, budgets uh, have consequences. Indeed. Thank you. Yield back. Thank you very much. Uh, and the chair would like to uh, mention that uh, Director Stone Manning, you mentioned that there's 147 projects waiting in the wings. I will submit to you HR1 will help as well. Uh, the next speaker is uh, Mr. Falcher from Idaho. Five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And uh, Director Manning, uh, Deputy Director Owens, thank you for being here today. On March 28th of 23, in House Appropriations Committee, it was Secretary Holland that stated the BLM has permitted more than 126 renewable energy projects, meaning wind, solar, uh, geothermal. Uh, and during these same hearings, she also said, since 2021, the BLM has approved 20 mines or mine modifications. And I think just a little bit ago, you said 22 is like 3,000, if, if I heard correctly. And then uh, uh, Deputy Director Owens, I think, came up with one possible mine modification or mine approval. So that's, first of all, can you speak to the disparity there? Or is there a disparity? Is it just a misunderstanding? Mm -hmm. And secondly, what criteria does a BLM or Department of Interior use to prioritize one project over another? Uh, Congressman, thanks for the question. Um, it, it's over 20 mines uh, that have been expanded uh, or modified or permitted. Uh, in the first two years, you know, ranging everything from everything from gold to lithium. And what was the 3,000 number that you had referenced a little bit earlier? Was that just simply renewable, or what was that, what was that just a few minutes ago? You'd referenced a, a number of over 3,000. Oh, I believe that was uh, applications to drill for oil and gas. Applications, not a permits. A APDs, that is, that is a permit. Okay, yep. what, is the pro what is the criteria that the Department of Material uses when they prioritize one project over another? Uh, thank you. We respond to uh, what comes to us. So uh, in hard rock mining, for example, a proposal walks in the door um, uh, and we respond to it, right? The 1872 mining law so says... So 126 versus 20, that's a, I mean, if that's right, that's pretty, pretty significant difference. So Thank you. I think you're asking about the renewable energy projects. Um, we do have a priorita uh, prioritizing project uh, um, sort of screen. Uh, is it close to transmission? Are there threatened endangered species uh, on the site? It basically, uh, it, will it be, um, is, it, is it ready for prime time? Okay, so there is a prioritization there process. Is. So, okay, so yes. given that uh, prioritization process of renewable, in this case, uh, compared to that of mining, does the BLM intend 
to similarly prioritize conservation leases over mining projects uh, with this new thank, rule? Thank you for the question. Um, again, we will take uh, requests as they come in the door and analyze them like we do in all of our other work. So just as a reminder, if, if you take the language in your rule proposal mm -hmm. at face value, that makes conservation a use, which is, as Congressman Westerman indicated, by default, that means other stuff doesn't employ conservation. So you got a, got a real conflict there, and I hope you recognize that. Uh, Director Manning, I, I want to encourage you to hold some in-person public hearings in my home state of Idaho. And uh, I think it'd be great if you'd be there on this public land rule uh, and uh, personally attend those. Um, and I also want to just point out to you that part of the reason that we are here is that FLIPMA is a job in, in those rules and putting those things in place. That's something that we're supposed to be doing as supposed to an agency. Now, you can always argue that we're not doing it well enough, but frankly, that's our job. And I want to just point that out to you. In uh, 2022, uh, S&P Global Report stated to meet electronic vehicle demand Unless there's a massive new supply that comes online in a timely way, the goal of the net zero emissions by 2050 will be short-circuited and remain out of reach. And as you know, the Biden administration is also seeking to create a carbon pollution-free power sector by 2035. Uh, Director Manning, where are those minerals going to come from? So, Congressman, I'm pleased to share, as I, I hope you saw, we issued a notice to proceed on the Thacker Pass uh, lithium mine uh, a month ago. That mine is going to deliver 20% of the nation's lithium needs. One mine. Uh, there are, uh, there's another mine coming right up behind it uh, uh, that we're analyzing now. Um, uh, and there are, as why I not, understand. Why not just go ahead and say, you know what, this is something we don't want to do. We're just, we want to get it all from China. Why not do that? Um, Congressman, we follow the law. The 1872 mining law um, says that when developers come to us with a valid claim, um, we respond and we and we go through the NEPA process. Director to Manning, it's about out of time, so I just got to tell you, at this pace, there is no way we're even close. This is it's a bankrupt uh, argument to say that somehow, some way, we're going to control this. Uh, domestically, because we're, right now we're dependent on foreign lands. Mr. Chairman, I want to enter into the record, I request to enter into the record, a letter sent to Director Manning last week by the Idaho delegation requesting in-person public meetings to be held in Idaho. Without objection. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I yield back. Thank you. The Chair now recognizes Mr. Mullen from California for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And thank you, Director Stone Manning, for all the work BLM is doing to promote renewable energy deployment on public lands. Uh, the rapid deployment of renewable energy on our public lands is critical for our country's clean energy transition. I would like to explore just a little bit uh, how we can get those renewable sources built out and generating power as efficiently and safely as possible. Many of the figures shared by the agency focused on permitted capacity which is understandable as the Bureau has direct authority over this part mm -hmm. of the process. But uh, can you tell us a little bit about uh, any disconnect between permitted and deployed capacity? And can you ballpark the uh, average wait time between when a project is permitted and when it is completed and connected to the grid? In other words, uh, actually deployed. Can you talk a little bit about that challenge? Uh, Congressman, thanks for the question. And I'm not going to, I can't ballpark because it, it really depends on the project, it depends on the financial backing of the project, it depends on a lot of things that are completely out of BLM's control. Um, I think the once projects are, um, are approved, I think what is in the BLM's control is uh, ensuring that there, there's transmission available to get those electrons to the people who need it, which is why we're so laser focused on transmission development as we speak. So uh, I understand that uh, transmission is quite a hurdle here. Uh, what other obstacles stand between a project being permitted and being deployed, and what can Congress do uh, to help that process move forward? Uh, Congressman, um, I would proffer that you might want to talk to developers to find out the the how to fill those gaps for themselves. Um, once BLM has done its job and gotten the permit, um, it, it's out of our hands. So I expect they would give you a better answer than I will. 
With that, I yield back. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Mr. Mullen, the uh, HR1 will help. I now recognize Mr. Tiffany from Wisconsin for five minutes. Uh, Director Stone Manning, um, uh, we're going to have a hearing this afternoon in the Federal Land Subcommittee about wildland fires. And uh, one of the quotes in there is from the gentleman that runs that unit. And I, I, didn't, under, I didn't realize this. There's 154 wildland firefighters that have died over the last number of years. Mm -hmm. And uh, his quote is, it's lo we're losing people at a terrifying rate. Why would you spend $7 million on EV infrastructure when you've got this tremendous backlog of land that needs to be dealt with and uh, that needs work and that these people need, um, uh, they need pay increases, they need the equipment to be able to do their job. Why would you spend $7 million on EV infrastructure? Congressman, thank you for the uh, question. This is an administration priority in uh, part to address uh, climate change. Do you, support, course, do you support that priority by the administration? I do, Congressman, because climate change is in part what is driving the dramatic increase in wildfires on what, our landscape. Um, what if you're wrong about climate change? What if it turns out that it really, uh, that we don't see three degrees additional uh, global temperatures by 2050? What if you're wrong about that? Um, Congressman, I'm not gonna second, second guess scientists from all over the country and all over the globe. So how about the over a thousand scientists that disagree with that, that say, sure, there's climate change, but it isn't man-driven? Uh, Congressman, again, I'm not gonna uh, second guess uh, client, climate science that is widely accepted. So we just heard that um, uh, we're gonna see the end of the world by 2030 by the person sitting in the, uh, uh, in the ranking member's chair in opening remarks. Uh, we had a vice president that said the end of the world was coming in 10 years. He said it in 2007. And then by 2017, he said basically the end of the world is coming. Um, is it possible that it may not happen? That, that climate change may not be the end of the world as so many people, as some like yourself claim? Uh, Congressman, I believe it is incumbent upon all of us to fix a problem that we know exists in our, in our world and in our country. Um, it's our obligation to future generations to do that work. But what if you're wrong? Uh, Congressman, again, I'm not going to second guess uh, what is uh, known to be true. So it's dogmatic that you simply, it's faith-based that you simply believe it. Even though there's been a pause over about the last 10 years when you read some of the leading climate scientists who are saying there's been a pause for about the last 10 years. Congressman, I believe we're gonna to agree to disagree on this one. Um, you talked about protection of landscapes and the conservation uh, portion of what you're attempting to do. It's uh, that's one of the priorities, protection of landscapes. Does the public wanna see windmills and solar um, arrays on those public lands? Uh, Congressman, thank you for the question. Change is difficult. And, uh, and it's our job to work with local communities to ensure that uh, any impacts are mitigated. So does the public wanna see transmission lines where they've never seen them before and are perhaps unnecessary if we didn't go this route? Uh, Congressman, again, thanks for the question. I think what I know uh, the public wants is to ensure that the public lands that we manage into the future um, are as healthy uh, as possible, that they deliver clean water, they deliver wildlife habitat, and addressing climate change is gonna enable I'm that. I'm glad you mentioned wildlife habitat. Does um, the public want to see all the endangered species that are being killed by these uh, Cuisinarts in the sky, um, by the solar arrays, what do they call them, flamers that go through, um, like what is it, the Ivanpo uh, project out in California, they call them flamers where endangered birds would fly through there and they'd just be incinerated. Is that what the public wants? Uh, Congressman, it's our job to work with our colleagues at the Fish and Wildlife Service to ensure that uh, any development we do um, takes into account the needs of uh, threatened fish and wildlife, and are we you, do that work. Are, are you familiar that FERC last week, Federal Energy Regulatory Commission, a few of the commissioners, in fact, there was like three of them, they said there's an elevated chance of blackouts and they're deeply concerned about the coal plant closures that are being proposed as a result of climate change? 
Uh, Congressman, I'm not familiar with that FERC study. Uh, I am familiar with the need for transmission, which is why we're working so hard to develop it, and I hope you'll fund it through this budget. Uh, they didn't just talk about transmission. They talked about production of energy. They said we are going to fall short if we continue in this direction that we're going. Final question. Uh, in regards to the letter that you wrote to the United States Forest Service, and you said you always follow the law, um, is tree spiking following the law? Uh, Congressman, I always follow the law and always have. Did you follow the law when you wrote that letter to the U.S. Forest Service? Uh, Congressman, I didn't write the letter. I retyped the letter and I always follow the law. I've been through a confirmation process. This old history um, was thoroughly vetted by the United States Senate and they confirmed me and I am here before you today to talk about the priorities did, of the Bureau. Did anyone go to prison as a result of writing a letter threatening loggers' lives? I'm sorry, could you repeat that question? Did anyone go to prison as a result of that letter that was written threatening loggers' lives? People went to prison as a result of my testimony against them. While well, you participated in the process. I did not participate. I yield back. Thank you. The chair now uh, recognizes Mr. Collins from Georgia for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Director Stone Manning, every administration has added new lease acreage to the pipeline for future production. However, as uh, the chairman stated earlier, you and this administration have leased fewer acres uh, for oil and gas drilling offshore and on federal land than any other administration in its early stages dating back to World War II. According to the uh, EIA, uh, global energy consumption is on track to grow by nearly 50% by 2050 and conventional energy sources like petroleum will remain the largest energy source over that time. Don't you think that uh, future demand should be met by production in this country where we do it cleaner and safer than anywhere else in the world? Congressman, thank you for the question. Um, President Biden and Secretary Holland are uh, very focused on energy security, which is why they are asking us to transition to the clean energy economy that we are aiming to deliver. Okay. <clears throat> All right. Um, I wanted to switch gears a little bit um, and ask you about some other things that you've been stating, particularly that you say you need more analysts and stuff. Your, uh, your FY 2024, 1.7 billion, if I'm right, that's a $200, 000, $200 million increase over the 2023 budget, correct? Yep. All right, so out of the $200 million, uh, how much is that going to go for additional employees? Uh, Congressman, I should have the FTEs off the top of my head, and I do not. I can tell you the areas in which we're going to uh, Well, I mean, if it's so money. important that you add an analyst, I would think that you would have those numbers readily available to support your sales pitch. I am, I am happy to provide them for the record. Um, we are going to focus on increasing staff in renewable energy, increasing staff in oil and gas, uh, increasing funding for the Wild Horse and Burrow program. So what percentage of that will go for oil and gas since, my, uh, since Mr. Hunt was asking about increasing or decreasing the time? Uh, the, uh, the oil and gas program is asking for a $10 million increase, which is 5% of the overall increase in, that we're requesting in this budget. And, well, you don't know that how many of that will go towards people power. Uh, no, but I can find okay. out for the record. Yeah, I'd love to know that. Yep. How many people are still at home working? Uh, Congressman, um, we have uh, people remote working. We have people teleworking. We have people working in the office. I don't have the numbers of uh, the breakdown for you. When, uh, when did you require them all to return back to the office and start working from uh, the office? If, if I can be clear about one thing, um, the 10,000 people uh, at the Bureau of Land Management who have a 25% vacancy rate are doing the work of two people at a time. Uh, and they work hard every day. Um, where they're working, I think, is less relevant to me. Ma'am, I like to say that just working. because you're working harder doesn't mean that you are productive. That's why we have offices, and that's why the pandemic was over. I don't know if you realized it earlier this week. And we have required that all federal employees get back in the office to go to work. You're up here saying that you need more analysts. More analysts. I need more staff. We hear this every time y'all come in or somebody comes in. But then when we ask, well, where's everybody at? 
Well, a third of them still at home watching The Price is Right when they should be working from the office where you can be more productive. We are $31 trillion in debt. 31 trillion dollars in debt how much debt's too much debt for this country? Uh, Congressman, I believe that's a job for the Congress to consider. No, no, you, you should have been part of the extra. You, I'm sure you had input on getting an extra $200 million put into your budget. You're, you're a part of this debt. So how much is too much? Where do we stop? Uh, Congressman, I might respectfully uh, say that the, a $1.7 billion budget is a lot of money, um, but... Uh, equated to the overall budget of the United States of America. Uh, this bureau is the biggest land management agency in the country, and we are the least funded. I think a dollar is a dollar to the American people, which you say you're committed to do the American people's work. I also think that you've leased fewer acres for drilling oil, and uh, I think that uh, just because you say you need an analyst, but you can't answer the questions of how many is a prime example of what we face up here every day when we have hearings that we can't get true answers on. So with that, uh, Mr. Chairman, I yield back. Thank you. The uh, chair now recognizes uh, Mr. Rosendale for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Good to be here today. Director Stone Manning, always good to see you. Uh, we continue to hear about transparency and the perception of self-interest in this committee from, in regards to uh, the directors and senior staff. Uh, as a known former collaborator with EcoTerrace, it's hard for me and many of my constituents to be confident that your decisions are guided by what is best for this country instead of being guided by what is your politi political activism and extremism. Two prime examples of this or the most recent rule disregarding 70 years of best range management practices to benefit one lessee in north central Montana, better known as the APR, which you and I have discussed many times over. Uh, the other is the new proposed rule that conflicts with the Taylor Grazing Act, which hurts Montana's significant ranching industry and threatens the longstanding relationship between our ranchers and public lands management. In 2008, while you were the regional director for Senator Tester, you received a large loan from one of his major donors at a below market rate that you had previously undisclosed until you were up for Senate confirmation for your current post. We had a lot of information brought out during that hearing that we had never heard before. Just two years prior to receiving that loan, while you were executive director of the Clark Fork Coalition, you made what you yourself described as an unprecedented act of supporting this donor's development project in Missoula. This, combined with your past history of collaboration with eco-terrorism, further gives the perception that you do not have the best interests of the American people in mind and instead will prioritize your own personal beliefs and friendships over those of the American people and this country. The new rule proposed by the BLM is in direct conflict with the Taylor Grazing Act, and the people that are going to be impacted by it the most are being severely deterred from participating and testifying because of the selected hearing locations being so far away from the areas that it's going to impact. Will you accommodate the request from this committee, several of the members individually, and the, community, and the uh, committee as a whole to change or add locations to hold hearings in the actual communities that are being impacted by this proposed rule. Congressman, last evening we had our first uh, public lands rule meeting. It was virtual, over 300 people came. It uh, lasted until nine o'clock in the night, uh, Eastern time. I'm not um, concerned about the previous uh, meetings for this proposed rule. What I'm asking you is that the locations that you have proposed to hold the hearings for this rule are in locations that are in urban areas that are far removed from the people that are going to be impacted. You just heard Representative Fulcher request. I have requested, and this committee's letter will probably hit your desks tomorrow, that says, will you add additional locations or change the locations so that the people that are going to be impacted, such as Fergus County, Montana, in Lewistown, would be 
added on to your hearing locations. Uh, Congressman, I look forward to that uh, letter and we'll consider it. Will you commit to this body that you will hold the hearings in the communities that are going to be impacted? I'm going to take that request back to the team and consider it. In your testimony, you mentioned how your agency managed 700 million acres of mineral estate, yet Biden administration has just canceled and withdrawn some leasing from some of the most mineral-rich land in the country. Do you believe that this withdrawal was proper? I'm sorry, do I believe this withdrawal? Withdrawal from, from leasing was proper? Uh, I, I do, Congressman. And why is that? Um, uh, we have 700 million acres of subsurface uh, uh, minerals, um, and there are uh, the right places to mine in this country, and there are some places that are just too special, and the watershed above the boundary waters is one of those places. So that's not the only place, is my understanding, uh, Mr. Rosendale, uh, would you yield to me? I will, you're Mr. Chair. Uh, Director Stone Manny, you just said the Boundary Waters is not a place to where you mine? Is that what you just said? I said the watershed above the Boundary you Waters. You said the Boundary Waters. Do you know there's going to be no mining in the Boundary Waters I, uh, or the buffer zone around it? And let's be clear about that. Congressman, and I yield back to Mr. Rosendale. Congressman, there was, a, there, was you, an adver there was a preposition there, above the, the boundary waters, because everybody understands that water flows downhill. Go, Mr. Chair, are you above the water, would you yield? I, I yield, Mr. Chair. Tell me, tell me the watershed above the boundary waters. The Explain that to us. The Rainy Creek watershed is hydrologically above the boundary waters. The Rainy River watershed. Yeah. And what's below? What, what what's the watershed below? The the Rainy watershed flows into the boundary waters. Director Stone Manning. Lake Superior Watershed, Rainy River Watershed are the two watersheds we're dealing with with the mining. The Biden administration pulled the leases for purely political reasons, and I can specifically say that, Director, because they wouldn't let an EIS go through, which, as you know, is the highest scrutiny the federal government can give a mine plan of operation. They won't even let that go through. Mr. Rosendale, I yield. Thank you very much. I, I see that I'm out of time, Mr. Chair. But I, if I could, could I ask one last question? Thank you very much. Uh, Director Stone Manning, as we see that you are trying to elevate conservation above just best management practices in these new rules, do you see similar withdrawals in the pipeline of what you've already uh, shared with us? Uh, Congressman, thanks for the question. I, uh, you may know that we're currently analyzing one at a place called the Thompson Divide in Colorado, uh, we're currently analyzing one in a place called uh, Chaco. So you do see similar withdrawals in the pipeline because you have elevated conservation measures above best management practices. Thank you. I yield back, Mr. Chair. Thank you. The chair now recognizes uh, Mr. Gosar from Arizona for five minutes. Thank you. Good morning, Director. Now, the administrator of OIRA makes a determination of whether or not a rule is major although this information would have been submitted to by the BLM. Major rules include those that are likely to result in, one, an annual effect on the economy of $100 million or more, two, a major increase in costs or prices for consumers, individuals, industries, federal, state, or local government agencies, or geographic regions, or three, significant adverse effects on competition, employment, investment, productivity, innovation, or on the ability of the U.S.-based enterprises to compete with foreign-based enterprises in domestic and export markets. The proposed conservation rule was not determined to be a major rule, yet in 2023, BLM published a blog noting the recreation activities on the BLM public lands contributed about $11.4 billion to the national economy. In fact, your own testimony states, and I quote, Programs administrated on public lands managed by the BLM supported on an estimated $201 billion in economic output and approximately 783,000 jobs, end of quote. As conservation leases would potentially lock off these lands to current BLM permittees, I'd like to understand how the Bureau determined that this rule, proposed rule did not have the impact of more than $100 million per year on the national economy or would potentially create an impact in cost for state and local governments as their local tax revenue could, could potentially dry up from all this economic output. Will you share 
the entire economic analysis conducted by the agency and submitted to ORIA to make that determination with the committee. Uh, Congressman, thank you for the question. Uh, as we were discussing earlier, the public lands rule is largely procedural in nature, um, implementing uh, existing uh, law through FLIPMA, and therefore, and therefore it received the determination that it received from OIRA. So, I mean, th th this is a major impact, and it should have the, the, the evaluation because of its impact to state and local communities. Let's, just, let's, talk, let's talk about this. So Arizona came into the Constitution and into this, this, as statehood. It was first rejected by Taft. Second now, in the second attempt, Taft required that Arizona take the federal estate and then coerced Arizona, said in lieu of, we would have the multiple purpose aspects of the land in, in, in respect. So forming a contract with Arizona. So withdrawal of this is huge. And the impact on Arizona would be immense. So I don't know why uh, it bypassed that because it, it, it has special designation to it. I want to show that you're going to show how you came about that this wasn't a major rule. Uh, Congressman, again, thank you for the question. Um, uh, OIRA made that determination, I believe, because this uh, rule is largely procedural in nature. Um, but, but I mean, it's, but it's a major economic impact. So doesn't that doesn't that take that rule and change it? Um, uh, any, any work that we do to restore the, land, the landscape to ensure our multiple use and sustained yield mission into the future, um, in fact, adds economic benefit. So for example, say we restore uh, 250 acres of cheatgrass and get it back into um, a bunch grass community that uh, is good forage. That actually is of economic value. Um, Any time we invest in the landscape to make it more productive in the future, which is what this rule is going to do, it benefits the American people. Okay, so let's go there. Did the BLM, BLM did not schedule a listening session in my state of Arizona on this proposed rule, which has, like I said, the potential to dramatically alter the way in which many of my constituents engage with the agency on a day-to-day -day business, not to mention its long, longer-term impact on their businesses, which are often generally owned. I, I understand the BLM is offering two virtual sessions, but you're making the assumption that everyone either has the ability to travel hundreds of miles in person to attend a listening session or to access broadband that is strong enough for these virtual sessions. For an administration that proclaims to value input from tribal communities and rural communities, I would think you would understand the challenges of Wi-Fi in rural areas or the lack thereof. I'm not sure if you've ever visited these areas, but often there isn't even running water, much less reliable Wi-Fi. I would like you to commit to holding a listening session in my state of Arizona for all those impacted by this proposed rule. Uh, Congressman, uh, again, I'll take that back to the team and we'll get back to you. Last question. Have you ever been contacted by an entity on behalf of a foreign entity or government or a group representing an interest in a BLM decision? I'm sorry, can you repeat that? I didn't hear. Have you ever been contacted by an uh, individual or foreign uh, person representing a foreign entity or government representing their interest in a BLM decision? Representing our interest in a BLM yeah. matter? Their interest, their interest in a B Have you ever been approached by a foreign entity or those representing a foreign entity on behalf of a, a BLM decision? Uh, N not to my knowledge, uh, Congressman. Um, I know that there are some companies that are, um, you know, in Canada, for example, or in Australia that I've met with over mining interests. Yeah, yeah, just really curious. I mean, from, from the standpoint of, uh, uh, we, we've seen, uh, if you remember Rob Bishop, uh, looking into some of the antics of China and Russia in regards to some decisions, trying to push money at, in publicity of these events. So we're just trying to make sure that the going on with those, those lines. Thank you. I yield back. The chair now recognizes uh, Ms. Porter from California for five minutes. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Director Stone Manning, um, the Bureau of Land Management has a really important job. Your bureau is responsible for making fossil fuel companies clean up the messes that they make. And to do that, you have to make them pay for it so that taxpayers are not. As you may know, the typical cost of actually plugging an oil well and doing 
surface reclamation is $76,000. Currently, the Bureau only requires Big Oil to put up a $10,000 bond to reclaim a well. So let's do a little math. Roughly, what percentage of cleanup costs would $10,000 cover for the typical well? Um, Congresswoman, not enough. Not enough. So the true answer is 13.2. $10,000 bond, $76,000 actual cost. Would you say an oil or gas company is cleaning up their mess if they only pay for like one-eighth or even less of the cost? I would not. So with requirements like this $10,000 bond, companies are sticking the American taxpayers with the bill for their mess. Today, I'm asking the Bureau that's supposed to be protecting taxpayers exactly what you've been doing to stop this. What are BLM field offices supposed to do if they find the $10,000 minimum bond for an oil and gas lease isn't enough to likely cover the costs of cleanup in their region? Congresswoman, thank you for the question. It's an important line of questioning. Um, as I hope you know, we have a forthcoming rulemaking on oil and gas uh, that includes uh, looking at our old bonding provisions. I, I appreciate that, Director Stoming, but before we get to the forthcoming rule, let's look at what the law currently says before we, we go make a new regulation. BLM's policy, as of at least since 2013, says, quote, it is the responsibility of the BLM state office to raise the bond amount above the minimum, $10,000, required by the regulations when there is an unacceptable degree of risk and potential liability to the federal government for the plugging and reclamation costs of non-plugged wells. So BLM offices have had now for at least a decade the, not only the authority to raise the bond, but they are required by their own policy that I just read to raise the bond above the minimum requirement when the 10,000 minimum isn't covering the actual cost of cleanup and reclamation. So what percent of BLM's own proposed bond increases, because they have the authority to ask for more, the duty, the requirement to ask for more, what percentage of BLM's own proposed bond increases has it actually secured from fossil fuel companies? Congresswoman, I do not have that in front of me. I'd happily get it to you. According to the Bureau's own 2019 memo, it was 16%. 16%. So if BLM can't enforce its own rules, and you're telling us you're gonna write new ones, how do I have confidence that we're not gonna have a repeat of the exact same problem? How do we trust that BLM this time is going to actually collect from fossil fuel companies an appropriate bond when it has failed to do so in the past? I agree that raising the minimum bond would help, and I heard from Secretary Holland that that is, they're working on a proposed rule for the revision, so first, can you confirm today that your proposed rule will raise the $10,000 bonding minimum? I look forward to sharing it with the public once it's through all of its internal review. So that's a no, you can't confirm it yet. Second, what factors should you be considering as part of your rulemaking to make sure that the bonding minimum actually covers the costs of cleanup and reclamation? Thanks for that question. There's been um, a handful of reports, uh, including from the GAO, that we're taking a very close look at on this very topic to inform uh, the work that you will see and I hope comment on shortly. Because you know, in the, Bureau, in the bipartisan infrastructure law, we had to obligate $10 million, $20 million to cleaning up these oil wells, to cleaning up the mess of the fossil fuel companies. And while I know it's tempting to point the finger at fossil fuel companies, and I have and will do so when they break the rules, we have to also be willing to hold ourselves to accountable as environmental stewards, including at the BLM. I would just urge you to think about how you're gonna reassure members on both sides of the aisle of this committee that when the new regulation comes out, we will have a better system and a better structure so that when BLM asks for a higher bond, they're not getting 16 cents on the dollar. I yield back. Uh, thank you very much. The chair now recognizes um, Mr. Duarte from California for five minutes. Hello, director. Thank you for being here today. Um, reading about wild horses, great American visual, um, but a bigger problem than, than what we're actually addressing 
in your in your report here, you're asking for 154 million dollars to uh, keep the ponies in a corral, 60,000 of them. We have a agreed upon. I think there's quite a process that agreed that 27,000 wild horses on the American Plains was an ideal number. At least that was the compromise. Currently, there's 80,000 by your estimates plus, and I believe from wild horse seminars I've been to, um, odd as that is, um, they grow by about 20% in population a year if left unchecked. And the, the wild horse, the detriments of these uncontrolled wild horse her herds on the Western Plain, these are non-native wild horses. So they interrupt with native species, they interrupt with grazing plans, where ranching families are attempting to sustainably graze their, their um, rangeland, make sure the the wild horses don't eat too much of the feedstock around the water holes, lest their cows can't get between the forage and the water hole. And young horses and old horses can't get between the forage and the water hole in many of these areas, and they simply die of either dehydration or starvation. So this is an ugly thing. This is ugly. Um, the only real way to deal with it is to eradicate wild horses from the plains. It's, that's the reality, I believe. You can put them on trains and send them to Mexico for horse slaughter. Um, we can revise our horse slaughter sh laws here in America, or we can appropriate $154 million this year per your budget request and something more next year and something more again the following year until we have 120,000 horses in captivity and 160,000 horses on the plains. Um, do you have a, a plan otherwise? Um, Congressman, I uh, appreciate the question and I appreciate you understanding the rock and the hard place that we find ourselves between with the Wild Horse and Burrow program. We are in fact responsible for 150,000 animals, um, 82,000 of them on public lands and 60,000 of them either in corrals or off-range pastures. Um, we have we use every tool that we are given um, and, and, uh, and we are asking for your help in more funding so that we can do the work of getting that, especially that 82,000 number, back down to 27 um, for the benefit both of the health of the horses and the benefit of the range. And to do that, you're looking at sterilization. You're looking at birth control for wild horses. Fertility is a big part of our work. So a wild horse takes, what, two or three years to get to gestational age. So, you know, at this point, we've got tens of thousands of horses. Now, we all know we're heading into a budget crunch here. Mm -hmm. So we can either eradicate the horses um, which I know is not, not something any of us want to watch, uh, but it's the reality. Or we can appropriate hundreds and hundreds of millions of dollars over the next five to 10 years, um, maybe up to a billion total, to provide birth control for wild horses and store up excess inventory in, in the manner you'd, or we can open up capture and export for horse slaughter. Congressman, that is a question for Congress. Thank you. Take the challenge. I'll wave back. Uh, thank you very much. The chair now recognizes uh, Mr. Carl from Alabama for five minutes. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'd like to begin by thanking the witnesses for being here today. As you both know, there's a mine operating in my home state of Alabama, the name Warrior Met Coal, that has been working on a lease by application for years. The LBA begins its scope in 2014, but is still and it is still pending. After uh, numerous, after numbers of uh, discussions with individuals at your department, I understand we're working towards a resolution on this issue, and I thank you for that. I appreciate you work working with me and the members of my delegation on this issue. I look forward to receiving the information uh, about approval timeline. Uh, on the LBA later this week, so I'm told. Ms. Owens, I have a question uh, on another issue. I understand your agency published a proposed rule on April the 25th known as the 10-day notice uh, to modify existing regulations to address potential violations under the Surface Mining Control Reclamation Act, as well as how citizens complain, uh, I think that's right, are handled uh, in the, ma the manner they're handled. I believe the states are doing a great job in this position right now, uh, given their borders. 
Given the 10-day notice rule just was updated in 2020 and, it, and is working well, I might add, why do you need to make such major changes to balance the state and federal authority in a new proposed rule? Thank you for the question, <clears throat> Congressman. Um, in 2020, the, as you mentioned, a 10-day notice rule was published in, tw in 2020. In 2021, the department took a, a, a look. We wanted to review and examine the 2020 rule. After that review, it was determined that there were areas in which the rule could be improved. And so we engaged in the rulemaking and have, as you also mentioned, on April 25th, published a revised 10-day notice rule. And among other, the reasons for the revision to the 10-day notice rule is that there, were, there remained uh, uh, burdens on uh, citizens who wanted to uh, file complaints or uh, share information with the state regulatory authority or OSMRE regarding potential violations at mining sites. So, and there were also, there felt there was a need for clarity uh, for the procedures of, the, of issuing and receiving responses and determining whether appropriate actions had been taken in response to those 10-day notices. So the recent 10-day notice rule is, was published to address all of those concerns that were disclosed upon a re-examination of the 2020 rule. So you think the federal government can do a better job than the state at processing those complaints? The federal uh, OSMRE yeah. under SMACRA has a responsibility to, um, SMACRA gives citizens the ability to file citizens' complaint. Well, and in fact, the 10-day notice process is established in, in the yes, Service when, Mining when Act. You, when, when, you got, when you got a government that takes nine years to process a, a, an application, I don't think they're going to process complaints quite as fast as they would in the state, too. The state level, uh, level has a way of moving quicker, and they still get criticized for time. Thank you for your response. Let me, let me uh, Director Manning, let me hit you up real quick. Uh, Congressman Porter kind of touched the nerve when she was talking about the reclamation of the oil oil fields, what's the bond cost for the solar fields and what's the bond cost for the uh, wind farms? Uh, Congressman, we do bond for both of those uh, activities and I'm gonna have to talk with the team and get you those numbers. They're not in front of me. Do you think that's enough to clean that up? Whatever the bond is on it? Uh, Congressman, I am on the working assumption that we have uh, learned from the oil and gas uh, uh, program and we are carrying that forward to the renewable program. Well, I, I would be curious. I really, because I don't know those numbers. It's not a trap question. I would, yeah. I would really love to, to look at that. With that, uh, Mr. Chair, thank you. Thank you. The chair now recognizes the gentlelady from Colorado, Ms. Bulbert, for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you to our witnesses for, for being here today. Um, Director Stone Manning, uh, so in Mesa County, uh, one of the great counties that I represent, um, we have been waiting more than five years um, for a particular parcel. Um, we, we've been waiting for the BLM to sell this 31.1 um, acre parcel of land in Clifton. Um, it, it's a it would be sold at a fair market value, and um, it's on the disposal list currently. And I, I just am curious if this is an issue that's on your radar. Uh, Congresswoman, you just put it there, and I uh, commit to you that I will look into it. Um, I, I would love to work with you on this. This is a big deal for my constituents in, in Mesa County. Um, it's something I've toured the site and have legislation um, to support this. So if there's something that we could find to work together on, uh, this parcel of land would be a great place to start. Um, now. My colleagues um, in this committee and in the House, um, they have claimed uh, numerous times during debate that wilderness designations don't prevent or restrict active forest management. Um, I'm curious if you agree with those sentiments. Uh, Congresswoman, we do manage wilderness uh, differently than we manage the front country, uh, but, we, um, but we do have tools at our disposal. So what, what are some of those tools? Because and, and Particularly, mechanical thinning is something that's prevented in wilderness areas, uh, and we are reduced down to old, long, two-man hand saws. Um, so is, it, do you think that that is enough to manage our forests with six billion standing dead trees in the West? 
Uh, that and prescribed fire, um, I, I think, is uh, what is necessary. A handsaw in and prescribed fire rather than mechanical thinning. So as a, as a follow-up, if, if we're serious about actively managing our forests, and I, I believe that we all are to some degree, uh, we just have different ideas on how to get there, um, we have to prevent these catastrophic wildfires. And certainly prescribed burns is, is one great way to do that and you know, forest cleanup and reducing the fuels that are, that are on the ground. Um, but would you say that we need more mechanical thinning um, on a larger scale in these, um, in, in these overgrown areas? Uh, Congresswoman, we are focusing that work uh, with great intent um, around uh, the wildland urban interface uh, in order to protect people and communities. Last year, we um, did about a million acres of mechanical treatment. This year, we're, uh, we've got a goal of about 1.3. And, and are you intending to increase the use of mechanical thinning? Around communities, yes, we are. We're focusing the work uh, in in um, in places that. Well, so in my district, we don't we don't have um, as many of those communities that would be affected, but we certainly have areas that my colleagues are trying to designate wilderness and already have, and that prevents us from actively managing our our forests. Um, and I, I believe that the greatest way to do this on a larger scale is to increase um, mechanical thinning. Um, uh, we, we have to reduce the 234 million acres of forest that's that's currently considered high risk uh, for these dangerous and catastrophic wildfires. So that's another thing that I would love to work with you on mm -hmm. um, because we have to be good stewards of the land that we've been given and actively managing our forests is one way to do that. Um, now, mineral lease sales, moving on, um, are required by law to take place at least quarterly. Mm -hmm. um, accordingly, there, there should have been at least nine rounds of lease sales in the past two years. Uh, with gas prices as high as they are, and um, there should have probably been more than nine, how many rounds of onshore lease sales has the BLM um, held in the last 28 months? Uh, Congresswoman, thank you uh, for the question. Uh, we held uh, a lease sale uh, in fiscal year 22. That was uh, five sales, if I'm remembering properly. We have sales now regular sales coming starting this month. But I think that the- How many sales you, are, are scheduled for this month? Because I, I'm showing that the answer is one. We've had one lease sale and um, the BLM is, is not currently complying with law here um, the, and truly hurting uh, domestic energy production. So how many sales do you have planned? In Congresswoman, um, uh, oil and gas production is at an all time high on federal lands um, and uh, Oil and gas uh, corporate profits are at an all-time high, 14% uh, of- So I, I live in a drilling community, and I, I can testify that uh, we have been regulated into poverty uh, with, with our oil and gas production um, because politicians get into office and um, virtue signal and, and make these um, uh, false claims about our good, clean energy production. And unfortunately, it is hurting my constituents. And so if we could work together um, to increase these sales and, um, and, and uh, increase future production, I think that would help the future um, revenues for uh, essential services like schools, roads, firefighting, and all of the things that we care about so much. Director Stone Manning, I'm over my time, and I thank you so much for your answers. Thank you very much. Uh, the chair now recognizes uh, Representative Hageman from Wyoming for five minutes. Thank you. Ms. Stone Manning, <clears throat> Governor Mark Gordon of my home state sent a letter on April 25th to Secretary Halen asking when the mine plan amendment for the Black Butte mine near Rock Springs would be forthcoming from the department. This application was approved by the state in 2021 but OSMRE has continuously requested more and conflicting information from the operator. The amendment has been through three NEPA reviews, all of which have been completed, but I understand it is still pending at the office of the solicitor. Why does this approval continue to be delayed and when can we expect it to be completed? Congresswoman, thank you for the question, but I believe that's a question for Deputy Director Owens. Yes. Okay. Deputy Director Owens. Yes, thank you for the question. Uh, <clears throat> we are processing uh, the Black Butte um, uh, mining plan modification. Uh, it is, as you noted, it is, with the, uh, it is with the solicitors. We've had some recent adverse um, court decisions on our mining plan. 
uh, app, uh, decisions. And so we want to make sure that the, as we move forward, the decisions that we make are going to be durable. They're going to be le legally defensible. Do you defensible. have an estimated date by when you will have it completed? I I'm sorry. Do you have an estimated date by when you will have this completed? I don't have an estimated date, but I can say that we, it is, uh, we, we are hoping that it will soon be out. Within, before the end of the year? I, I can't say that today, but I can get a uh, better understanding and, and give you a better answer. Director Stone Manning, are you aware that the USDA Forest Service has administrative responsibility to manage the Taylor Grazing Act grazing di districts in the National Forest System under the Federal Land Policy Management Act? Yes. Uh, when writing the Conservation and Landscape Health Rule, did BLM confer with USDA Forest Service? Uh, Congresswoman, thank you for the question. Uh, we did confer with several different uh, departments across the Did you, did you confer with the USDA Forest Service? We did. Are you aware that the uh, NEPA requires agencies to assess and resolve programmatic conflicts before moving forward with a rule? Yet BLM has claimed a categorical, a categorical exclusion for this uh, rule under, under, under NEPA. Is that correct? Uh, Congressman, yes, this uh, rule is procedural in, in nature, which is why it only requires a CADEX. Well, that doesn't seem right. Um, Director Stone Manning, my, another question has to do with the conservation leasing system proposed by the BLM Conservation and Landscape Health Rule. Under the current interior system, oil and gas leases on BLM lands are valued using a market analysis, and FLIPMA requires the Secretary of the Interior to maximize revenues for the benefit of the American people. Are you aware of that? Uh, can you repeat that? Are you aware that the FLIPMA requires the Secretary of Interior to maximize revenues for the benefit of the American people? Uh, yes, and I'm also aware that FLIPMA asks us to balance those uses. Okay, and to my knowledge, there is no system currently that exists for determining how conservation lease values would be established, which will then leave it to uh, valuation by third parties or pure speculation. That seems by definition to be arbitrary. Wouldn't you agree? Uh, Congresswoman, I would not agree with that. Okay. Uh, Director Stone Manning, we have a chart. Well, I guess we don't have a chart in here. Oh, right over here. That shows oil production on tribal lands has decreased during this administration. And consequently, approval of tribal drilling permits has declined significantly under your watch. In fact, in fiscal year 2020, under the Trump administration, the BLM approved 405 trial APDs. And uh, since you've been here, there have only been 158 that have been approved. The revenues from energy production on tribal lands are very important for tribal economies, as I'm sure you're most likely aware. Uh, this administration often talks about equity and about how energy development is somehow, and production is somehow racist. Yet the Department of Interior itself estimates that undeveloped reserves of coal, natural gas, and oil on tribal lands could generate nearly $1 trillion in revenues for tribes and surrounding communities. For many tribes, energy development is the primary revenue generator to fund education, infrastructure, and other public services on tribal land. Getting those permits approved is essential for many tribes. And I think it's worth pointing out that this administration's policies are very destructive to the interests of our tribes and our native populations. Will you commit to working with Congress and the tribes to expedite approval of tribal application for per, per, uh, applications for permits to drill? Congresswoman, thank you for the question. We work very closely with our colleagues at BIA in implementing Indian allotments. Um, and, uh, and I would also proffer again that we're at an all-time high of uh, production on our federal lands. Um, you haven't answered my question. Will you work closely with Congress and the tribes to, sh to ensure that we can expedite uh, the, the tribal applications for permits to drill? Congresswoman, I would happily work with your office and uh, with your tribal constituents on implementing the law fairly. Again, you didn't answer my question, but that's just the way that it goes with this administration. Thank you, and I yield back. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, <clears throat> I'd like to thank all the witnesses for the valuable testimony today and the members for their questions.
The members of the subcommittee may have some additional questions for the witnesses, and we will ask you to respond to these in writing. Under committee rule three, members of the committee must submit questions to the committee clerk by 5 p.m. on Friday, May 19th. The hearing record will be held open for 10 business days for, for these per, uh, responses. If there's no further business, without objection, the committee stands adjourned. <laughs>